Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California for our program today about San Francisco's Proposition D on this November's ballot. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and usually Michelle's co-host for this program, but today I'm flying solo because she is needed elsewhere today. So at the Commonwealth Club, we are producing hundreds of programs a year on a wide variety of issues, online as well as many in-person programs. Head over to commonwealthclub.org for more upcoming programs as well as video and audio from past events. If you're watching us live on YouTube, Ask your questions in the chat box and I'll work some of them into our conversation here today. Now, let's meet our two panelists. Uh, very glad to have uh, these two with us. First, we have Maureen Sedonin, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco. Hello, Maureen. Hello. And returning to the Commonwealth Club virtually this time is State Senator Ka Scott Weiner. He's a California state legislator representing San Francisco and Sacramento. Let's get started and let's start off, if you will, kind of set the table here. Let's let's lay out what the situation is and what is it, how is, if you will, the landscape for affordable housing in San Francisco? What are, what's the need and what are the challenges? And maybe start with you, Maureen. You know, I, I think the, the, everyone knows that San Francisco is one of the most expensive markets in the United States. Um, the city has, um, you know, has a, a a, a big void of how many affordable houses houses that we have in the city. Um, the median time frame for approval of residential developments as a developer, I'm super sensitive to this, is currently 27 months. So this makes us an outlier in California. And next to the longest median time frame is Palo Alto at 19 months. More typical is Oakland for five months, Los Angeles, 10 months. So more time and more uncertainty means more cost for affordable developers. And families are not just moved into homes, quick, just not moved in quickly enough. And this additional expense can also make it very different, a big, huge difference in whether the project pencils out. And so, you know, Proposition D will clearly and directly help with this with this problem. Senator, I know you've been working on this issue since you were a, a supervisor here in the city. Um, give us your perspective on it. Yeah, <clears throat> this is really about the future of our city, our region. Um, you know, I, I've lived in San Francisco for 25 years. I've seen this deep housing crisis, this housing shortage from many angles, back to when I was trying to find an apartment when I first moved here in the 90s, uh, to my effort to, to buy a home, to my work as a <clears throat> lawyer defending low-income renters facing eviction, my work as a neighborhood association president, elected official. I've seen it from all the angles. And it fundamentally all boils down to we don't have enough housing. We don't have enough places for people to live. And that causes people to have to move, to have to live in overcrowded situations, to be evicted, to become homeless, and so forth. <clears throat> and it is way, way too hard to build any kind of housing in San Francisco. It takes an enormous amount of time, years and years, um, it is so unpredictable. You can be um, uh, have a perfectly good project that gets killed or gets uh, mangled up. And we need to give people more certainty that if they follow the rules, they're going to get their permit fast. That's what this is about. Maureen, you know all about navigating those rules. I want to talk a bit about or have you talk a bit about Habitat's work here. And I want to start by noting that behind you in your Zoom background, is a habitat development. Um, I'm one of the neighbors of that development. I literally can see it right outside my window and I welcome it. Um, but tell me from your perspective, what's it like to try to, what, what is so difficult about trying to develop in the city beyond just the fact that it's a relatively small geographical area? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, the, the project you see behind me actually is coming full circle because it started when uh, Scott, Scott Wiener was a supervisor and was approached by the owner of a home um, in Diamond Heights who wanted to develop his mother's home into affordable housing. Um, so follow the story forward. Um, we were able to uh, receive his home from him and the home was in very bad disrepair. Take that home down and put eight homes that you see behind me um, for two, three and four bedrooms. 
um, in Diamond Heights, which is a fabulous neighborhood. And the neighborhood has been incredibly welcoming. And I'll tell you a quick story, which was when we did the first community meeting, we had over 70 people show up at the police academy for the uh, project. And only 70 people in the room were for the project. Two people had opposition. So it was this incredible sort of mythology busting where everyone thinks everyone's against affordable housing and people just aren't. And so what we see time and time again is really good projects that have gone through all of the planning, the zoning, the uh, entitlements, the CEQA, the environmental review, and then they get politicized and they get stopped at a time when they really shouldn't. And so that's why the years and years get added on. It's not because as developers, we need years and years to do this. It's because it gets stopped and politicized when either the supervisors come in like they did with Stevenson Place or other people in communities come in and block really good, really needed projects. And I think, you know, something else I would say is we don't just have a housing affordability crisis. We have a, a housing production crisis and we really need to build more homes. We need to figure out every creative solution that we can in San Francisco to create more housing for more people and particularly for low income and moderate income folks. And so Prop D is a leapfrog for us in that way. And I, I think it is really important to understand that this does not in any way take away people's voices. Right. right? The, the, the voters and their representatives still set the ground rules, what the zoning is, what the design standards are, and so forth. Um, but the system that we have now is extremely anti-democratic. Uh, we have this extreme system where every permit is what we call discretionary, meaning even if you follow the rules, you might you still may not get your permit. It's totally, it politicizes every permit. It makes every decision political and at times arbitrary. And you could have a project where, which has strong community support and all it takes is a small number of people to be really loud about it, to start filing appeals and, and lawsuits, and it, can, and it can bog things down and even kill a project, especially affordable housing but by nonprofits, which, you know, making it take years and years financially could kill the project. So this is really about good government and depoliticizing some of these housing decisions. Yeah, and just to, you know, to underscore that, I think if you look at the project behind me, like this is clearly a nod to the Eichler homes that are in the neighborhood. We had community process and input. We had a lot of participants. And now we have hundreds of volunteers from the community and around the city coming to work on the project every day. And so people, people have their hands on the clay when we're putting these things together. We don't do it in a vacuum. And I think, and all the developers that, you know, in the city, you know, it's community first, it's housing first, and then it's let's get this done and solve this problem. Well, let's dig into Proposition D specifically, and I'm going to read it. This is the exciting legislation reading part of the meeting, but let me run through it because understanding this, and we'll later get into Proposition E, I, I think it's important to kind of understand what we're actually talking about. So here's here's the petition or the, the, the form. Uh, Shall the city amend the charter to streamline approval of affordable housing that provides one, housing for households with incomes up to 140% of area median income, AMI, but where the average household income is no more than 120% of AMI. Two, additional affordable housing units equal to 15% of the required number of affordable on-site units. Or three, housing for households that include at least one school district or city college employee with certain household income restrictions. And to no longer require board of supervisors approval for those types of projects if they use city property or financing. Uh, Senator, tell us about what, what does that actually mean in, in layperson's terms? Yeah, what it means is that if you follow all the rules, you get your permit and you don't have to go through an arbitrary, discretionary, politicized process. So right now in California and San Francisco, we are one of the very few and maybe the only city where every permit is considered discretionary. That means that even if you check all the boxes, follow all the rules, the city can decide if it wants to give you the permit uh, or not. And what that also means, and that means that you, for um, anyone can challenge the permit for something called a discretionary review, uh, which means it goes to the planning commission 
and they can be appealed beyond that to the Board of Permit Appeals. So multiple appeals that can take a long period of time. Uh, we also have a large number of types of housing that need something called a conditional use permit, which means that you, you have to apply to the Planning Commission for permission to get the permit, even if you followed all the rules. And the Planning Commission can either grant the permit or say no to the permit or chop your project in half, very arbitrary. And if you don't like um, if the if the opponents don't like what the planning commission did, they can then appeal it to the board of supervisors, and the board of supervisors can then make a political decision about your permit, even if you're following all the rules. And so this is one of the huge, big problems with San Francisco housing, that every housing permit, whether you're putting, just you know building a two unit building or a hundred unit building, um, you are subject to the political whims and this arbitrary process that can take three, four, five, ten 10 years. Uh, and what Prop D will do is to say no more of that, that if you follow all the rules with the height and the density and the design standards, and you put in the required affordability and you pay your construction workers a good wage, you get your permit within a matter of months. Uh, so it's, it's, it's truly good government. We call it ministerial or streamlined approval now so the the end of the the text that i was reading to no longer require the board approval for those types of projects if they use city property or financing so are the, do the supervisors still have to approve and like anything built on a, on a private lot that still adheres to all these other uh conditions um no they they would be taken out of it and, and, and the funding part that that's for affordable housing in particular so a lot very often there's not always, but very often there's city funding in an affordable housing project, say for formerly homeless people or for um, just low income families or low income seniors or former foster youth. And if the Board of Supervisors retains the ability to decide whether to put that, approve that funding or not, that effectively makes the whole project discretionary and politicized again. because. The board could say, okay, you're entitled to your permit, but we're rejecting the funding, so your project is dead. And so what we want is for the funding to all be, of course, approved by the board of supervisors and the mayor as part of the annual budget, right? They would set aside, we're putting aside, you know, $50 million uh, for affordable housing for the fiscal year. And that would, of course, be appropriated by the board of supervisors and the mayor. But then for each individual project, you would not have to go back to the board of supervisors and say, okay, for the $2 million for this project, you know, the board would have to sign off again, which is what the problem is. So we take that out of the political realm and into the good government. If you meet all the requirements, you get your permit realm. Maureen, what would Proposition D if passed mean for your organization and for even, you know, other uh, affordable housing developers in the city. What, how big of an impact do you think it would be? Yeah, I mean, it, it will be really significant because again, just like every developer, time is money for us, right? And so when we go through the process, as Scott said, we check all the boxes, we have done all of the things that we're required to do. Um, we wanna be able to put our shovels in the ground and move forward. And when we get stopped because of some arbitrary reason, um, it takes up a lot of time and a lot of money. And so you know, those carrying costs on the project, et cetera. And also is the opportunity cost loss because we could be getting going on another project and moving that forward to expand our mission impact. And I think this is true for all developers. And, it, you know, all of my colleagues that I talked to, and I talked to almost everybody from the major affordable housing developers in San Francisco is like, we need to make this easier, better, faster, and not get caught up or tripped up um, in the politics of, um, you know, these, these things that are just are onerous uh, across the board. And I think another thing that's worth mentioning is, you know, this, this measure targets, you know, up to 120%, which for a family of four in San Francisco, it's only $166,000. And so it's not, you know, and it said that the average income that you would need to purchase a home, a market rate home in San Francisco is $340,000. So they're, you know, far from that number. And so I think it's also important to know that this serves a really good swath of homeowners. And so that would help us as well as we're looking at expanding our AMI and having mixed income, you know, 50 to 120% AMI for families um, and, and residents in San Francisco. And actually to, to kind of 
maybe follow up on that. Because she said, you know, as for all developers, time is money, even more so for you in the sense that for a, if I'm developing a bunch of luxury condos or market rate condos, yes, I'm getting extra costs. I can barely be screwing up my, my obviously the, 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 the construction team and all that kind of stuff. But I can also then charge more for those condos. And I don't know, I, I think, you know, Salesforce has lots of employees who can, who can afford it. But for you, you, you've got certain targets I'm sure you're trying to hit in order to be able to serve the people who with, with lower income. So um, it's more important to you than- Yeah, absolutely. Ab delayed. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, again, give another example from our Amber Drive project in Diamond Heights, we have the 800 homes and we had 514 San Francisco applicants through the mayor's loss of the housing. So the need is great and we really need to make this work and keep it moving and keep growing our impact everywhere we can. If, okay. I, excuse me, if I could just add there. Yeah, absolutely. For nonprofit affordable housing builders, you know, these delays and lawsuits of appeals can be devastating. But just to be clear, even for the, for the market rate builders, right? You've, I think you refer to it as luxury housing. I actually take issue with that. I'm not criticizing you or anything, but because it's just in the general debate with your luxury housing. Well, yes, there, there are certain specific projects where you, you know, have a massage, a massage service and a door person <laughs> that can be, but, but most of the market rate housing, it's not luxury. It, it, it's new, um, <laughs> but it's no, it's no more luxury than the hundred year old um, flat uh, in, in, in the Castro that's selling for $1.7 million. That's not luxury housing. It's just expensive because there's not enough of it. But when for the market rate privately produced housing, one of the reasons why it is so expensive is if you're a, a, a private developer trying to build some 30 or 40 unit um, apartment or condo building, the more expensive we make it for you to build by making it take five years to get approved. So you have to hire all sorts of you know lawyers and other consultants by putting you through the ringer, by putting all sorts of requirements in the project. What that means is that the only kind of housing that pencils out is to be able to charge high rents. If we made it less expensive to build these projects, we wouldn't have that same uh, pressure. So anytime you put costs on new housing, that is ultimately going to be paid for by the people, the renters or condo owners who ultimately live there. Well, and also thinking about matriculation, right? When people start in a low income rental and they can move into a, like a 100% affordable home ownership, like with a habitat model, for example, or they can move into the market rate and they can, you know, every time someone moves into a unit, someone else moves, comes behind them, right? And so I think, you know, we just have to, we have to realize we're in an ecosystem of housing and we're trying to deal with it in our city in a really strategic way, but we need to stop saying one thing out of one part of our neck and doing something else on the other that undoes what we've just said on, on the left hand and the left hand and the right hand need to come together and really make it happen. Now I need to recognize, of course, we're talking about Proposition D and I've got two proponents of Proposition D in here. So let's work in the question from the audience, which is just help me know who or what the opposition is to Proposition D and why. So could you yeah. frame that please? Yeah, so the opposition <clears throat> and the opposition to Prop D has their own sort of Trojan horse sabotage ballot measure Prop E, uh, which will not result in any new housing. <clears throat> it's a completely, um, it's like a diversion to try to trick voters into not supporting Prop D. Prop E is really bad. <clears throat> it is not pro-housing at all. So the opposition to D, there are, um, uh, there are the NIMBYs who don't want to see any new housing and they want to have all the tools in the world to kill new housing. Uh, there are people who just only want um, subsidized housing to be built. And um, I support subsidized housing, but we need both subsidized and non-subsidized because if you say only subsidized housing should be built, you're telling the middle class to screw off because we're not going to be able to subsidize the middle class. Um, and in fact, 99% of low-income Californians live in market rate housing. So we have to build all kinds of housing. Um, and then... One of the unfortunate parts of this fight is the one of the one of the creators of Prop D and leading proponents are the car is the carpenters union um, because we have strong uh, labor protections in there for prevailing wage, 
healthcare benefits and protections against wage theft. Um, there's a rift right now where the, um, the building trades um, who represent some of the other crafts, um, uh, they uh, want different um, labor language called skilled workforce. And so they're opposing Prop D because they want different labor language. And so it's a very unfortunate rift between the carpenters and the, the, and the building trades unions. Um, I have a lot of respect for both. I work regularly uh, with both, uh, and it's uncomfortable for a lot of us to have this kind of labor rift, um, but that is part of the, um, the fight. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the reality is that there's just not enough skilled and trained labor force, and we need these pipelines to bring people forward. Um, and even at Habitat, we see this with, you know, a partnership that we do with a youth build program at the Success Center, where these young people are getting training to become the, ready to go to these other apprenticeship programs, but they're not ready just from the gate. And so these opportunities really do support that kind of growth as well. The other thing I think, you know, that, that you know, the, that I really, you know, brought Habitat to the table, not only because we just see how practical and smart this is, but um, is 82,000 voters in San Francisco voted to put this on the ballot. Um, and Proposition E was a risk, and, and we tried to bring the other supervisors into the fold to support this. And they decided to put Proposition E on the ballot after Prop B uh, was moving forward. And so unfortunately, as Scott said, it seems to be something that it's a little bit disingenuous about wanting to have more housing in San Francisco. The Senator mentioned uh, Prop E and uh, political scientists and analysts like Dr. Larry Gerson have pointed out that when there are competing or confusing propositions on the ballot, voters often react by just saying no to both. So what, what are your fears or is, the, or is there a way of, I assume this is part of it, of informing people about the differences and, and, and explaining them? Um, how much of a factor do you think Proposition E is going to be in Proposition D's success or failure? Well, it, it is confusing, and that's and Prop E was placed on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors for the very purpose of confusing voters. And just to reiterate what Maureen said, Prop D went on the ballot with the signatures of more than 80,000 San Franciscans with a broad coalition uh, behind it. Um, you know, it's, that's about 10% of... Uh, of San Francisco residents signed, one out of 10 San Francisco residents actually signed the petition to put it on the ballot. It was a massive grassroots effort. Prop E did not collect signatures. It was after Prop D was already in the works and happening, the people who did not want to see Prop D, instead of just opposing Prop D, said, we're going to we're gonna have the Board of Supervisors put on a sabotage measure to confuse the voters. And if you just read the two ballot questions, it can be very, very confusing to the voters. And the reality is that Prop D will result in a lot of new housing much faster, um, including affordable housing, mixed income housing, and so forth. Whereas Prop E um, has so many unbelievably huge requirements on it and limitations in it that it won't result in new housing. Prop E requires um, a lot of additional costs um, that when you combine everything together, projects are not going to pencil out. Um, and so, that is, um, you know, and that that was, you know, frankly, why it was put on the ballot. Um, and I'm, I don't want to broad brush the Board of Supervisors because it was a split vote at the Board of Supervisors, but a majority of the Board uh, of Supervisors put this sabotage measure property on the ballot to try to drag property down. And that means that the property campaign has had to do a lot of work, which it is doing, uh, and I think it's working, to make sure that the voters understand the very stark differences between D and E, that D is pro-housing, E is anti-housing. Yeah, and I think, that. you know, again, I, oh. you know, I just, I was just going to say, I think, you know, for us, you know, at Habitat, obviously we don't use our brand lightly, um, but we believe this is the best thing for San Franciscans to get more, all kinds of housing, um, including affordable housing. The Housing Action Coalition, a very broad group, SPUR, Carpenters Union, you know, uh, the mayor who, you know, ha has, come on and off of different housing uh, initiatives, you know, is really behind this as well, really sees it as a, uh, a forward solution. So I think, you know, when it comes down to it, I mean, I, I hope people wade through it and see that, you know, and maybe just stop at D and vote for it. <laughs> um, because I think it's really critical that we don't let the confusion, the intentional confusion stop people from doing the right thing. 
Uh, Senator, you mentioned uh, uh, this was there, there were some dissenters on the board from from uh, placing E on, on the ballot, um, though they did manage to be unanimous when they killed um, uh, was it, that, that wasn't the Stevenson, Stevenson. Uh, project. Uh, could one of you maybe explain what the Stevenson project was for for anyone watching this who, who uh, don't, doesn't remember that, but also kind of that for those of us who do remember it, it kind of crystallized in a lot of people's minds that this is San Francisco's approach to housing. So I, I don't think it wasn't when Stevenson was killed. It was <clears throat> it was not <clears throat> excuse me. It was not a unanimous vote. Okay, sorry. Oh, um, that's I right. That's right. It was not uh, supervisor. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Supervisor um, Safai, Supervisor Stephanie, and uh, then Supervisor Matt Haney uh, all uh, voted uh, for it. Um, so it was an eight to three. Uh, yeah. vote. But maybe there, there have been other unanimous uh, votes. No, you're that, absolutely right. Yeah. I think in a, in a, a SOMA or something like that. But either way, um, so you've got a board of supervisors and you've got a system in the city that does kind of, it, certainly right now you've got an anti-housing majority on the Board of Supervisors, and you've got a system that that really um, puts the brakes on all the, the steps of the way. So is Prop D the answer to everything, or is are there further steps you would, that would you, you see being necessary? Because what is it, San Francisco needs to create, was it 82,000 units of new housing by 2030? And I'm just going to take a wild guess and say we're not on track to doing that. It is, it is ironic that 82,000 housing units and 82,000 votes <laughs> came to put this together. I but I'm going to let Senator, we Senator Weiner. There's no greater uh, knowledge or champion in our whole country than Senator Weiner on housing. So I'll uh, defer yeah, to you, I Senator. Mean, no, uh, there are some pretty smart people around the country, but thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, we do. Uh, uh, so the, the housing, every eight years, every city in, in California receives um, housing goals from the state. It's called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation or RENA. Um, and uh, in terms of how many units the city is expected to deliver for market rate, moderate income, low income, and very low income. Um, until the, historically, first of all, those numbers, whatever numbers the city got, they were, it was like sitting and collecting dust on a shelf. There was no consequences if you didn't meet them. We have put consequences in place um, in California. In addition, uh, the numbers were way too low uh, and it was very politicized. Some cities were able to get a uh, allotment of almost zero. The most famous is Beverly Hills in the last eight year cycle received the arena allocation of three, three, one, two, three, three units for an eight year period. Um, so it's it's really now was an outrageous process. I actually authored a law in 2018, Senate Bill 828, that completely blew up uh, this process, RENA process, and put it back together again to require that the numbers actually meet our housing needs and to put guardrails in place to prevent the rich cities from shirking their responsibilities. As part of that, um, we're, we're now seeing much higher um uh housing allocations san francisco's allocation went from something like twenty-seven thousand to eighty-two thousand, so basically tripled uh and it, it is going to be really challenging and we're going to see more cities uh not meet their goals but <clears throat> we can really try our best and it's not unattainable prop d is going to be critical for san francisco coming into compliance with state housing law because if we continue to make every permit chaotic and political, if we continue to have an average permitting time of three plus years, then there's no way we're ever gonna create enough housing. We're gonna have no shot whatsoever. If we pass Prop D and we make it much faster, it's not the only thing we need to do, it's not a silver bullet, but it will put us at least in the game to be able to create that housing. And again, we want to comply with state law, we need to, but fundamentally, even more than that, we want to have places for people to live. You know, and I think we can get a perfect storm when we get the affordable, affordable housing developers, the market rate developers, the, you know, policymakers, uh, the great leadership from the mayor's office of housing, the mayor herself, like people all leaning in together 
the community, like as Scott said earlier, the, this, the community is not, they're, they're in, uh, you know, and with Prop D, we have 82,000 so far who think, let's get this on the ballot and move it forward. So I think it's really important to remember that as well. So yeah, the goals are very high and, and it's a little bit of a wake up call for everyone around the state. You know, in our, our habitat, we cover a three county region. But what I can tell you is the cities that are stepping up and saying, yes, let's do this. Let's build more housing. Let's work together. And something like Proposition D that will help facilitate that and remove these onerous barriers that are that are basically redundant and politicized, I think we're going to make a lot of good traction and a lot of momentum going forward. Do I have this correct? The uh, Board of Supervisors is, uh, I guess I'm not sure, the, the progress of the fourplex and sixplex uh, in the city, was that to be voted on today? I thought they'd reworked it. Um, and that it, it looked like it had a good chance of it, it is today yeah it is okay yeah and there was a um an agreement reached i believe between the mayor and supervisors so yeah. um so yay <laughs> <laughs> well might might be one more uh small advance that, what, yeah <laughs> um, one more small small step for mankind <laughs> yes um so you've been going about and, and doing these informational talks and, and talking to voters. What sort of reaction are you getting both about Proposition D and E? Are people confused? Are, do they get it when you're, you're laying out the differences between the two? Uh, Maureen first. Um, you know, I think it's understandable that people are confused, but people are getting it, especially as we sort of explain it. It just sort of makes sense to them and that they really do truly, I think, see Proposition E when they really understand the processes and what went into putting them both forward um, that one was just trying to obstruct the other and i don't think people I think people are smart and people are thoughtful and people want to do the right thing and so i am finding that i'm also finding that you know and as i gave with the diamond heights uh, experience you know the community is excited about seeing more housing there's not one person you could ever talk to in san francisco who thinks that lack of housing lack of affordable housing lack of market rate housing lack of anything is not a problem. Everyone agrees on this. And so I think, you know, and when we have the coalitions like the Housing Action Coalition and SPUR and others coming forward, you know, that are, have data to prove these things, that are reasonable, that are working with people on the ground, you know, we're just getting a lot of great support. And I really, um, I look forward to the election day because I think this is uh, going to prove itself out. Senator, are you optimistic? Um, yeah, I think people, I think when people take a look and they, they look also at what groups and people are supporting Prop D and opposing Prop E, uh, and they, I think San Franciscans are really engaged voters and there's a bunch of San Franciscans who will just figure it out on, on their own by just looking at it, but others will say, hey, the people I trust on housing are supporting Prop D and opposing E, uh, and so I'm going to go with that. Um, but that, you know, that's why the campaign is really important, even more important than I think in other situations. They can save the confusion for the two online gambling uh, ballot measures. Exactly. Um, it's a whole other drama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and of course, your dialysis centers. Um, so, Maureen, you said you, you work in, in three counties in the Bay Area. What are some of the developments you're doing there? And, and what what is there any trend in the types of housing that's needed that you're that you're working on and what are your needs as an organization yes uh, thank you john i think that you know we're working in marin san francisco and san mateo arguably you know three very expensive counties in the, in the country i think we rank uh, one or two uh, next to someone in connecticut um so i think what i would say is this the places where we are having traction and we have almost 200 homes in our pipeline that we're looking to build in the next five years and we're adding every day where I was just out yesterday looking at a site in San Francisco. Um, you know, coming together with people and saying this is going to happen, the cities that show up at the table and want to partner and want to make it work is where it happens because for any developer market rate developers nonprofit developers when you go into a city and everything is hard. You just don't want to do it. It's too hard. It's too expensive, and it's a little demoralizing, you know. And so, when we find that kind of receptivity and that reciprocity, the way people want to work together to give and take and get something done, and we certainly have that in San Francisco with the mayor's office of housing, um, and I and with the mayor, and I think with many of the supervisors. So I think you know it's really important to remember that. And I hope for the folks that are you know out there something for e that they'll come over and get involved because i think together we can do a lot of things and we can matriculate people from rental housing into affordable home ownership into market rate housing and sort of continue on and so 
the rest of the cities, you know, we're, we have an 80 unit development in Novato. Um, we have 33 units in Redwood City that we're in entitlement. We have 18 units in Menlo Park. Um, we have another 50 unit project in San Francisco that we would love to move forward. So we just have to get this right. And it's so important because it is, you know, it is a matter of, you know, we are a small organization with, you know, big visions and a lot of trying to have a lot of impact. We're also doing critical home repair. So we're working across San Francisco to keep very low income seniors in their homes and doing critical repairs on their homes so they can hold on to those assets. About 87% of the people that Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco serves are people of color. I'm very excited to say that on our Amber Drive project so far, about 50% of the homeowners are coming off of that long wait list that's been in the city for people who've been pushed out of housing. So there's a lot of great things happening and we just need to keep this momentum going. And we wanna invite people in, not push them out. And I think that's one of the things I'll say about the organizations of, that are behind Prop D is we're, we're, we want to bring you in. We wanna invite you in. We don't wanna uh, invite you out. Senator Weiner, you've always got some housing bills uh, before the state legislator, legislature, excuse me. Uh, what are you working on now? What are their prospects? And uh, what maybe do you, can this, what can the state do next? Sure. I mean, we've made some really good progress, but we have a lot more work to do. I'm very focused on, uh, you know, we have a very robust uh, state housing law that I authored in 2017, SB 35, um, that streamlines housing approvals statewide. Um, we need to uh, try to, we want to try to make that permanent because it has a sunset date. Uh, and then uh, I've tried a couple of times, but hopefully third time's the charm. Um, or uh, we want to try to pass uh, a law that makes it much easier for um, religious institutions, particularly churches, because they're the most prevalent, <laughs> um, but also nonprofit colleges to build affordable housing on their land. A lot of churches and synagogues and other religious institutions have uh, excess um, land uh, and, and they want to build housing, but the zoning and the approval process doesn't support it. So we want to try to make it easier for them. So those are a couple of things that I'm working on. In a previous job, I was a senior editor for a magazine called Affordable Housing Finance. And so we were constantly writing about these kinds of projects. And Maureen, I know there's uh, with, with I'm a subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Don't forget to renew. But yeah. I do remember there was always a lot of talk about, you know, talking to developers, whether they were a, a you know, an Episcopalian church in St. Louis that's trying to build four units of seniors housing or someone building, you know, someone dealing with you know millions of dollars in bonds in a, in a big city or whatever there are always a bunch of layers of financing that were needed and and I think this kind of also goes to the the delay and the cost and the delay and just the trouble of getting all that stuff to come together once but then when you have further delays what that can uh, can add to it but the reason I'm bringing that up is there's obviously been a huge evolution in in, in uh, certainly the federal approach to uh, you know affordable housing over the decades. And for quite a while, kind of pretty much all it was doing, or the most of it was doing, was in uh, uh, tax credits. What what help is there from the federal government, or are, have they kind of pulled even further away? Yeah, that's a great question. So about 98% of all affordable housing resources funding, public funding, goes to rental. And so for those of us that are doing ownership, we'd love to see that expanded to 20% of the housing. So Senator Weiner, whenever you're ready to do that bill, I'll call you up. We're ready to go. Um, so Habitats Across California are very working very hard um, to do that. But we were just successful in um, getting the governor to put our $350 million back into the state budget for Cal Home, which is one of the state programs that California has that comes down from the federal government and then is a, a state set aside that then goes out um, to nonprofits and to cities um, to build affordable 100% home, home ownership. Um, so there, it's really limited. And I think the federal government right now is really trying to do more and they're trying to expand the financing and trying, you know, one of the reasons to look at some of these AMI mixes and splits as well is it does help you pencil out a project when your funding stack has a varying level of, of affordability. Another thing that we've been doing is partnering with private developers who have been very generous and in order to get their in loop fee or their impact fee or their, their, what they're responsible for to a city, they partner with a nonprofit developer, either a Habitat or another uh, rental, like a Bridge or a Mercy or a Eden. And they, they can bring all those resources to bear. And I think one of the things the federal government has done is sort of under, started to understand that more and facilitate it and help people do that. 
also with things like um, the market rate housing uh, credits, and there's other things that we can really use in our toolbox that we haven't been able to use as much um, that we'd really like to be using more in the future. But funding is a really big issue. And because we're building homes and they're as expensive as if we were a private developer when we're building them many times. And so it's that, that subsidy, that funding stack that brings those housing, in our case, mortgages down because Habitat does a zero down, 0% zero interest mortgage for our homeowners. We cap their housing expenses at 30%. So it allows this sort of incredible opportunity for people to be able to become first time home buyers. Senator Wiener, uh, how is the federal government as far as a partner in any efforts you're trying to get done on the state level or is housing is it better that it actually is a state and local responsibility? Well, we want the federal government to be more involved. And one, one of the great things about the, the last presidential um, election, at least in the Democratic primary, housing was a big issue of discussion. I don't recall that ever happening in a presidential primary before. Um, and, you know, we've yet to see real results in Congress. Congress is gridlocked for a lot of reasons. But I think over time, we will see greater federal involvement, more funding in particular. Um, but also, I think Congress has a role to play in terms of fair housing laws, because we continue to see uh, cities in California, but elsewhere, um, adopting housing policies that are leading directly to segregation. Uh, and so I think uh, there is a there is a federal role. Yeah, and I think if, if you look at Build Back Better and you look at the housing components of that, I mean, it's a great blueprint for uh, promoting housing across the United States. And so it's sad that it didn't get through, um, but there's really good material there for everybody to use on their local level. Um, so one of our viewers uh, writes, uh, the federal government was involved when redlining occurred. That's not necessarily- a, Indeed a... they were. You know, and I, I always tell the story, my dad was a, a, a gunner pilot in World War II. And, you know, I, I remember, uh, and he died when I was young, but I remember a story that was passed on in my family through my mom actually that said, how sad he was because his co his co pilot in the plane he was the bomber and the other guy was the pilot was an African American man and he got a GI Bill loan to buy his first home and his friend John couldn't get one and I mean that's just like that's one generation of like impact and I just think we need to step up we need to move the needle and I think cities need to stop talking about housing and leveling the playing field and not have more affordable home ownership my viewpoint it, it's funny you say that because I tend to think of this as, you know as the old saying that it affordable housing or housing even is is like the weather in San Francisco everyone complains about it nobody does anything about it it does seem like there are some some green shoots some some progress being made um so we shall see uh, absolutely get... can't stop won't stop right <laughs> Senator Weiner exactly <laughs> um so proposition D if it passes and it needs what 50 percent plus one to pass am I correct um would it, what, it, when would it come into being or when would it take action or and, and when do you think people around here would actually start to see some results from it? You want to go, Senator Weiner? You want to go? <laughs> you know, I can't remember the exact um, implementation date. Is it January 1st? Or... I think it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as with everything housing, nothing moves as quickly as we want. <laughs> Even if you set the best rules, People have to find available land. People have to, um, you know, propose a project, get their financing in order, whether they're nonprofit or for profit. And so, it, 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 and and new housing laws have a way of having a little bit of a slow burn, but then they accelerate and it becomes exponential. So I I think you know, as, I think both sides of the housing debate, the people who want to see a ton of new housing, the people who are terrified of having new housing. Um, both sometimes have the perception that housing is going to just sprout up overnight, um, and that's not the way it works. So I think it'll probably start slowly, but accelerate dramatically over time. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I think one of the things about this is, you know, we said earlier, I think it's, this isn't the silver bullet. It's one really good piece of legislation, and we need many more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, just remembering that and continuing to bring people together in this kind of coalition to move things forward that makes sense, that streamline. That don't, don't get people choked behind the counter and can move projects forward as, as fast as we can, as those of us that are building homes can build them. And Maureen, has the challenge been with, let's just stick strictly with the affordable developers, has the challenge been that it it's taking this time and all the cost, or have you seen any affordable developers actually pull out of San Francisco area and just say, look, 
you know, this isn't for us right now. I have seen people that are doing broader projects across the state, you know, not not have it as the highest priority for them because they're really trying to have a mission impact, right? I mean, everyone in my, my shoes, no matter what kind of affordable housing they, they build, is trying to get more people in homes so they can afford it, they can live and work and thrive in the communities in which they, you know, are, are living. And I think that, you know, so when we make it hard, we make it really hard. And I think it's just it's so unnecessary. Okay, so to wrap up here, let's let's people already have their ballots. I've already mailed mine in. I'm sure others have as well. But a lot of people I know like to either wait later or still uh, go and show up and vote. So let's I'll ask each of you, starting with you, Senator Weiner, um, your your going away words. What what do you want people to keep in mind uh, about this uh, proposition D? Yeah, I think it's really really basic. The question is, do you believe that if someone follows all the rules for housing, height, density, design, et cetera, if someone follows all those rules, should they get their permit or should they have to wait years and years and maybe have the permit rejected for political reasons? This is about good government. If, if we believe in good government, as I think we should, then we set the rules ahead of time and if you follow the rules, you get your permit, period. That's what Prop D does. It's not a radical um, proposal. It's, it's in line with how cities across the country do it. Uh, and it is common sense good government. And Maureen, CEO of yeah. Habitat for Humanity, Greater San Francisco, you're going away words on this. Yeah, my going away, there, we're away words are this. I think, yeah, this is good government and it's best practice and we should do it because we're a smart, informed and beautiful city and we want to keep it that way. Um, I think the second thing I would say is this is about people. This is about people getting in homes. This is an affordable housing measure. And so if we care about the folks who take care of our children and who check us into hospitals, who draw our blood, who help us when we have an emergency, who you know clean our storefront, we have to care about this proposition and we have to vote for it. And so my last word would be really cheesy, but I was a high school mascot, you know, proposition D it's for me and it should be for you too. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Maureen Sedonin, uh, CEO for Habitat for Humanity, Greater San Francisco, and Senator Scott Weiner, uh, representing San Francisco in Sacramento. And thanks to all of you watching and listening to us online. Uh, again, you can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org. Stay safe and have a good rest of your week. Goodbye. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Weiner. You too, Maureen. Bye, everyone. Bye.